Turn, if you will, to Psalm 32, only because I just want to set the context or the stage, if you will, for what we want to talk about tonight. We want to talk about forgiveness uh, and the importance of it, and then also how to apply it in our own lives, but then also how do we apply this when we're coming alongside and ministering to others. I'm going to assume that uh, conflict is somewhat a relevant issue within your lives. Um, that, you know, if it's not with you, you at least know people who experience conflict at some point and that forgiveness is a big deal. Uh, forgiveness obviously is a big deal when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. We're at enmity with God. We're, we're born that way and we all people are in need of reconciliation. I mean, somewhat of a, if you can, you can think of it this way, that there's a, that's a simplified version, if you will, of evangelism, is ultimately you're just going to people and saying that I'd like you to be reconciled to God because you're at odds with Him and experience His forgiveness. And in Psalm 32, we have David who, uh, again, the context, if you think about 2 Samuel and the heinous sin against Bathsheba, against Uriah, against the nation of Israel, against his own army, against the Lord, ultimately, as he said in Psalm 51, that you alone, Lord, ultimately, it's you I've sinned against. I mean, you're the one who is the law maker, and it's your law that I have transgressed in many ways, and my sin is ever before me. And one of the things he says there is, is that, Lord, if I have the opportunity, I want to teach transgressors your ways. And Psalm 32 becomes uh, an expression of that teaching. And in Psalm 32, it's a teaching psalm by way of his own testimony and his own experience. And ultimately, the message of this is you need to turn to God quickly. Don't hesitate in running to God with your sin. Don't hesitate. He's a safe person to go to with your confessed sin. But he opens it and he closes it. It's a bookend to the psalm, and that is the joy that is found in forgiveness. And, and so he just opens. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. And often that's used. That's not just subjective, like in the sense that do you feel blessed kind of a thing, which I still haven't figured out exactly what that feels like. I mean, whether it's warm, is it cold, I don't know. But, you know, it's just that idea, do you think you're blessed, right? There's this essence that we experience that. But from this stance, there's also an objectivity to it. There's an objective judgment that God is making that the truly blessed person is this person. And David experiences as well and recognizes that this is truly the blessed person. Of all the blessings you could ever consider and think about, and as I think about even telling my story and telling a little bit about who I am, all those things are great blessings, but the greatest blessing is my name is written in the book of life. Right? And so he says, blessed is the one, and then who is that one? It's the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And there and lies the crux of it, is that you're honest about your sin because the blessed person is forgiven, his sin is covered, and the Lord counts no iniquity. And that really what the psalmist is doing and what David is doing is he's using three synonymous words with slight nuances to express the totality, if you will, the exhaustive nature, the comprehens comprehensive nature of the topic. And what he's basically saying is, look, all of your sin has been completely forgiven. There's not one thing hanging out there. Oh, I forgot to pay that bill. Nope. It's all covered. Every transgression, forgiven. Every sin, covered. And he counts no iniquity. That is the truly blessed person. My wife and I are just, there were a few things that have happened to me that helped me, kind of remind me of a little bit of what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 1. He just talks about the mundity of life. Life is just kind of mundane. And he talks about the sun comes up, the sun goes down, the sun comes up, the sun goes down, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. Although when I first landed here, I did question that. But um, the sun comes up, the sun goes down, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. We take this for granted in California, by the way. 
Uh, if you don't get out and enjoy the sun one day, it's like, eh, it's okay. It'll be out tomorrow. Right? Okay, it's just, it goes down, it comes up, it goes down, it comes up. Solomon talks about that. He talks about the rivers continue to flow into the oceans, and yet they never overflow. And then he makes this statement, a generation comes and a generation goes. And there were just a couple of things that I got thinking about. My wife looks at me and just says, do you really just stop and think about these things? I go, yeah, I do. Um, she thinks I'm a little odd. But, you know, it was a couple years ago, I was teaching at Boyce College, and we had incoming freshmen, and I recognized that those incoming freshmen, not one of them, were born in the 1900s. Yeah. Yeah, you want to get aged? Go be a college professor. They never age. Only you do, right? Because the kids are always the same age. But all the freshmen, not one of them were born in the 1900s. I was like, whoa. Was, you know, it just got me thinking about that for a while. And then, and then I was thinking, even just the other day, I said, okay, you know, I wanted to look up, like, who's the oldest person on the planet right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're thinking like my wife. Okay. I'm like, who's the oldest person on? And I, and I don't remember the number. I think it was somewhere around, like, you know, 111 or something of that nature. And so, anyway, all I know is this there's nobody on the planet right now. Born in the 1800s, that's done. None at all. And matter of fact, the truth is, nobody born in really 19 through 1910 on the planet in existence today. Uh, a generation comes and a generation goes. And Solomon goes on to say, and there's no remembrance of them. So much significance we put on things that are just passing by. And what David is pointing us and drawing our attention to is blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And then he closes, look, many are the sorrows of the wicked, the unforgiven. But the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. So, if you're forgiven, be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So it is a joyous thing for us to talk about forgiveness and understand that a little bit better. Uh, in your notes, I'm going to make sure I cover everything in your notes. However, there is a section that if I have time, I will cover that's not in your notes, but I just want to give you a heads up, okay? But let's start and just talk. Uh, if we're going to talk about forgiveness, we need to talk about God's forgiveness. We need to start there. Okay? What is God's forgiveness like? Uh, and the first point we want to make is that the nature of God is to forgive sins. That that, that is the nature of God. So w why is this important? Well, we're going to talk about forgiveness in a few different potential counseling situations that you're going to have to face. One is going to be the issue of people who wrestle. We're going to talk about guilt and repentance in, I think, one of the sessions tomorrow. But there are going to be people who wrestle with guilt. And part of the reason they wrestle with it is because they don't believe God forgives them. Okay, It becomes a theological issue. We have to understand, whenever we're discipling people, remember you learned the heart of every problem is the problem of the... Heart, yes, good. Okay, so we have to recognize, too, when it talks about the heart, does it only talk about desires and passions? This is a trick question. No is the answer. No. Yeah, good. Okay, okay, so I want to make sure we're here. Okay, so, so no is the answer because when the Bible talks about the heart, it talks about the immaterial self, the inside, soul, mind, heart. All of it refers to, well, on the inside, it's everything you think, Okay? And it's everything you want. Okay, So it's all of that. And sometimes you, we have to remember that when we're talking about trusting in the Lord, so at the end of that psalm, you, you hear David say, those who trust in the Lord, okay? And you may have to say to somebody who just seems to be wrestling with that issue, you need to trust what God says. But you know what they might not know? They might not know actually what God says. 
And, and so there's a, a kind of a, a, a principle that I like to teach in, in the sense of when you come alongside other people, sometimes you have to build a foundation of theology that can bear the weight of a command. Okay? So don't just don't tell somebody, hey, trust if I'm not sure if they understand the God whom I'm asking them to trust in. This epiphany came to me by way of coaching baseball. Okay? You got these eight to 13 year old boys, and I'm sitting here telling them every time they get behind in the count, I'm saying, protect the plate! Protect the plate! And they know that coach always yells, protect the plate. You know what they don't know? What in the world does protect the plate mean? <laughs> they have no clue. I'm yelling a command, and they have no idea what that is. We have to be very careful that even when we know what somebody might need to do, do they know how to do that and what that actually entails? And so that's why we need to understand the nature of God to forgive. The other reason we need to understand the nature of God to forgive is because we're God's children. And, and we are expected to imitate him in our relations with one another. So we need to know how God forgives so then we know how to forgive others. So there's the passive side, if you will. You are forgiven. You're understanding that and what God does for you in that relationship because you have, God's never done anything to sin against you that you need to forgive God for, so that never happens. That, never, that transaction never takes place. And you only need God's forgiveness to be a flourishing human being. Thus, on the idea of human relationships then, I need to then know how to forgive and be that kind of a person toward the people that I'm ministering to, toward the people that I'm in relationship with, and I need to know then how to help others do the same thing and to think through that. So that's why it's so important for us to understand just this theology of, the, of just starting with the fact, look, it is nature of God to forgive sins. Psalm 86, 5, for you, O Lord, you're good and forgiving. You're abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. You're loyal and you're committed. And the beauty of all of that is, is recognizing this comes from a God who has no beginning, no end, and needs nothing. He needs nothing. He's not compelled by anything to forgive and to be steadfast in his loyal relationship to any of us. It's all by choice. My wife and I, we were newly married. We, you know, we used to go fishing. And what I mean by that is we'd say, why do you love me? That's going fishing, right? You know, right, I want, I want something back. Okay, and, and so, and then we'd go back and forth. They'd be, oh, because you're this and because you're that. And we're like, oh, oh. okay. And then over time, we just got convicted of how bad our theology was. Because then, it, you know, we began to realize, wait a minute, God doesn't love us this way. And then finally, it was just, look, why do you love me? Because I choose to. There's nothing about you. It's just I choose to love you, and it'll never be dependent on what you do or who you are, except I choose to love you. And now that began to, wow, this is really us putting the gospel on display. Making a willful choice, compelled by nothing except our own will, to love. Really important for us to understand. This is the nature of our God. And every sin then can be forgiven by God. Again, He forgives all things. Hey, he forgives all things. Okay. He forgives all iniquity. He heals all diseases. Psalm 103, verse 3. Okay. And he was ready to forgive you while you were still his enemy. And before you were ready to even ask for or receive it. He stands at the ready. I mean, that's, that's the beautiful picture that we get with the story of the prodigal son. Right? It's the readiness of the father to forgive. So we, we have to take a real gut check there in the sense of are we ready to forgive? What if our enemy were to humble themselves and repent one day? Would you be ready to forgive them? I had a situation with a married couple and the, the, the wife was 
um, walking away from the Lord. She was certainly not living according to the scriptures, and the husband was faithful, and he was coming to church, and we were praying with him. We were praying for them. A lot, we were going after her as much and as best as we could, uh, and this went on for a good three years or longer. And then the Lord got a hold of her heart, and he just rejuvenated. I mean, he regenerated that heart, and she repented, and she was a new person, and he didn't want to have anything to do with her. He had cultivated that time, and he had cultivated bitterness in his heart to such an extent that when she had repented, he was not ready to forgive. And boy, we did, we did not see that coming. Because everything about him, it just seemed like he was ready. And it was a really strong reminder for me that I need to make certain I am very diligent about asking those kinds of questions of those who are in relationships where there's a lot of hurt coming from the other person. Are they ready? If they were to forget or if they were to repent today, would you forgive them? And we recognize this is a struggle. I mean, it was a struggle in the New Testament. I mean, you see uh, many of the people in, uh, as they interacted with Paul, that some were <laughs> quite weary. I mean, here was a man who was torturing, terrorizing, uh, and having people killed for Christianity. And, and then God just grabbed a hold of him, and he repented, and he was a completely new person, and now he's coming into church. And you have situations where you have to imagine, we don't have it in detail, but we just, let's just imagine to a certain extent there could be relationships within those churches that were greatly affected. That relatives of theirs or maybe were already or in prison at the moment, maybe some of those relatives were even killed. There are going to be some children that have no parents as a result of that man. And now he's an apostle and teaching in the churches. And so there's the tension, there's those issues there. And what we seem to just see is that the believers over time, I mean, they loved him. And there was a beloved relationship between him and the members of the church. And so we see the tension, but we also see God winning out, if you will. Okay? We see God winning out. All right. He forgives again out of his mercy and grace, not because you deserve it. So again, that's something that's really important as we think about and we teach on this is it's not about a person deserving their for your forgiveness because we don't deserve his forgiveness. Yeah, there's nothing about you that just says, hey, you know, Lord, you know, I, yeah, I, I deserve it. No, not the case at all. Okay. Again, God being rich in mercy so look at the reasons, okay? What was it about God that is behind his forgiveness? He's rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Look, Paul is taking all the steps that he can to express as much as he can with words, kind of the excitement and the emotion behind this, right? God is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. When? Well, when we were dead in our trespasses. And he made us alive together with Christ. And so it's by grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Okay? This is our God. And he forgives you completely. He forgives you completely. There's no residual. There's nothing left. He forgives completely. And so we recognize that when we are forgiven, that we are changed. We're changed. Forgiveness changes us. Forgiveness changes us. At your spiritual birth, God established a new relationship with you. As your father, he removes the judgment of condemnation. This is, this is why we can read Romans 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And so as your father, he cleanses you from all unrighteousness as you confess your sins to him. Let us, no matter how many times we say it, let, let's not let the meaning of it just pass over. Let's not dull our hearts because we repeat it so often. But the great truth of 1, Corinth, or 1 John 1, 9, it's an if-then statement. He's faithful to do his part. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I mean, that's pregnant with meaning. And so we want to be very careful, even asking the Lord to help us in that. Lord, as I memorize that passage, as I repeat that passage so often, as I even express that passage to others, may I never lose sight of what it means to my life and to those in whom I'm ministering to. So when God forgives us, He no longer deals with us according to our sin. Does He forget it? No, he doesn't forget it. The whole idea of the phrase that he forgets it, if you will, it's that he does not bring it to remembrance. He does not dwell on it. And ultimately, this is the main point. He doesn't deal with us according to it. This is the tremendous grace of Psalm 103. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. These are great passages, by the way, when you're going to teach people on, the, on God's forgiveness. And this is why I just want to say, don't teach about relational forgiveness with others until you know for certain they understand what God's Word has to say about God's forgiveness of us. Okay. We need to make sure, because we want to make sure, again, everything that we're ever going to ask somebody to do is connected, tethered to, tied to the theology of who God is. And so we want to make sure they understand that Psalm 103 is a great psalm to go to with this as well. Psalm 32 is good. Again, 1 John 1, 8 through 10, uh, that's very good. All of that's good. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, all good. Romans 1 through 11, okay, 6 through 8 in particular if you want to focus in. But he does not deal with us according to our sins. Turn that around. What would life be like if he dealt with you according to your sin? Have we ever stopped to consider that? What would your life be like if, and this is something you could even ask your counselee, okay? And, and then if they need some help, uh, you could turn to parts of Revelation. You know, you could turn there. I mean, I just read today I, in my reading, I was on Revelation 19. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. The name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses." And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe, on his thigh, he is named, written, King of kings, Lord of lords. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come. Gather for the great supper of God. Now this is in contrast to the marriage supper of the Lamb that he just mentioned. And it's going to be fun. And it's going to be good. And those who have white robes, those who are in the righteousness of Christ, are going to be at that one. This is a banqueting table. This is a party, if you will. But not this one. The great supper of God. To eat the flesh of kings the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And then it just goes on. So that would be him dealing with us according to our sin. And the early part, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals, of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the 
glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Mm, That is you not being dealt with according to your sins. So Psalm 103.10, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. And so when He forgives, He no longer will charge the guilt of your sin to your account. Good news? Absolutely. Okay? So when God forgives, He removes your sin far from you and from His presence, and He promises to remember it against you not to remember it against you any longer. Micah 7, 19, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And you see this story played out over and over and over again throughout Scripture. You see it throughout all of Scripture. No matter how far Israel would fall, and when they came to the Lord confessing their sin, He showed mercy. It's in His nature to do so, and He delights in doing it. You remember, this is a self-appointed nature. Okay? So it's not like a dog. You know, in the sense you put a, you put a really good piece of meat right in front of a dog, and they just start salivating, and, they're, and, you know, and it's not like the dog's thinking this, but let's just imagine the dog's thinking this, right? I can't control it, right? I can't control it. I just keep salivating. I'm salivating all over the place. You know, okay, no. Right? It's not like that. It's not like God, this is God's nature, and he just is like, oh, I don't want to forgive him, but I can't not forgive him. i got to forgive him. Why? It's my nature. God doesn't do that. Okay, God's never opposing his own nature. It's a self-determined nature. So he delights in doing that. He's chosen to do that. This is who he is. And he never withholds it when sins are confessed in a sincere biblical manner. Okay, so this is just, that's just an overview. Whenever you talk about forgiveness, do not forget to talk about the forgiveness of God. Okay, make sure that's talked about. So when you, when you get into discipling and counseling people in the area of forgiveness, make sure you cover those topics, okay? All right, so now let's then talk about what would our response then be to God's forgiveness, okay? In light of that, because theology is practical. Theology is practical. We are expected to live out what we believe, and we actually live out what we believe, You can give mental assent to things. You can always say, I believe this, I believe that, so on and so forth. You can do all of that. But just saying it is not believing it. Believing it is actually by faith responding to it as if you believe it. Okay? Responding to it as if you believe it. One example, Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge, God is our strength, God is a very present help in times of trouble. What are the circumstances? Verse 3. He uses poetic hyperbole to describe the worst case of circumstances that could ever happen. No matter how bad things get, and in the middle, there's an application. There's a response to the theology in light of those crazy circumstances. We will not fear. So the practical approach to the craziest of circumstances is to approach it with courage and confidence. Based on what? Based on the fact that God's my refuge, my strength, and my very present help in times of need. My theology is practical. My practice is theological. This is going to be very important when we start talking about this area of forgiveness. Because how I respond to others says what I believe about God. And the two cannot be separated. Two cannot be separated. Make no mistake. I can't tell you how many times I have to remind people that your relationship with others, especially in this area of forgiveness and reconciliation, intimately is, is intimately connected to your relationship with the Lord. Okay? Intimately connected. You cannot separate the two. I often say do not sacrifice your relationship with the Lord for this issue. 
And I've had some of the most heartbreaking conversations with friends of mine, longtime friends, ministry partners, and one gentleman in particular who was leaving his wife. And I sat across from him, and, and I just I said, why would you do this? And we talked a lot of things, but in the end, I just, why would you do this? Why would you invite the discipline, I mean, literally just invite the discipline of the Lord on your life and to actually interfere with your intimate walk with the Lord? And his response to me was just simple. Look, I would rather take my chances with God. And, and I just, just thought, why? He just has no clue what he just said. It was like the first thought in my mind was just what Jesus and Stephen both said. Look, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And so it's, we need to think through that. So what do we need to think through in the sense of our response and application? Well, we do forgive others just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So again, we're talking about one aspect of reconciliation. In order to have reconciliation, you have to have um, a party confessing, repenting and a party forgiving and then you have reconciliation so right now i'm only talking about one equation i'm only talking about one part of the equation and that's forgiveness and part of that is because when you are counseling someone who has issues with other people i know that sounds so uncommon okay who have issues with other people okay you have that person to counsel and, and so Romans 12 reminds us we are to do whatever is up to us to be at peace. So if I'm the offender, what is up to me? Confess, repent. If I'm the offended, the sinned against, what is up to me? Forgive. Okay. So if I'm with that person, not the other person, and remember Proverbs 18, 13, and 17 here, by the way, Okay, the one who gives an answer before he hears, it will be to his folly and shame. 17, like it, the first person to plead their case seems right until someone else comes and examines it. Okay? We're the hero of our own stories. And so recognize that even as you're addressing somebody, okay, I got a text today from a counselee, and it's a husband. And we talked about a number of things about sacrifice and da 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 da. And then he, he just went on a tirade texting me about what his wife did, what his kids did, and did it, did it, did it, did it. And my response, now you have to consider, will you love the Lord or will you love you? As you think about how you will respond to those issues. Assuming, assuming that you have judged the matter rightly, which you should not assume. You should hold loosely whether you've even judged the matter rightly. And so with humility, ask questions. And seek to understand so that you be not a fool and judge the situation wrongly. Okay? We have a whole nother course on text counseling. Okay? Um, <laughs> so we're reminded in Ephesians 4.32 and elsewhere, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, <gasps> as God in Christ forgave you. And therein lies practice, that is theological. Theology is practical. Your practice is theological. As God in Christ forgave you. Therein is the, th the theology of forgiveness in your relationship with the Lord. And that is why we have to first talk about that. That's what Paul alludes to. He does it there. He does it in Colossians and elsewhere. And then there's a willingness on our parts to grant forgiveness whenever another confesses sin to you. There's a willingness on our part to grant forgiveness whenever another confesses sin to you. Now, <clears throat> what that means is, is I'm not now going to relate to them according to their sin, okay, except what is necessary. And, and what I mean by that, there may be a confession of sin, but there may be such a pattern that there's something we still need to address and deal with, and we want to come alongside them. Also, there's a misconception about forgiveness, that forgiveness somehow just eliminates all consequences. Okay? That's not the case. Was David forgiven? Yes. But did he bear consequences for his sin? Yes. Most certainly he did. Okay? Okay. There are going to be consequences for a person's sin, and so forgiveness of it doesn't remove all normal, natural 
consequences. So we willingly grant forgiveness. We forgive any type of sin. This is another issue. We're not discriminatory when it comes to sins. Well, we'll, sin, we'll forgive some sins, but not others. Well, you need to understand, that would be true if you held to a Catholic view. That would be a good actual application, that there are just some sins that are unpardonable. That there are some sins that are unforgivable. That'd be true if you held to a Catholic doctrine. My assumption is you do not. And God forgives every type of sin. Every type of sin. When we cannot discriminate. Because our God does not discriminate, so we don't have the right to do it for Him. Okay? We forgive on the basis of His grace and not on the merit of the person to be forgiven. So again... We just have people in our lives. Look, there, there are people in our lives. I've, I've kind of broken some of the people in my lives as like those are my pretty sinners and those are my ugly sinners. And what I mean by that is what happens is this. It's like even when this person like does something right, I'm always like, mm, okay? And then this person over here, they like are totally blatantly doing the wrong things. I'm like, I am good, okay? It's like those are my pretty sinners, you know. They're just good people. They're good-natured people. Yeah, I know they sin, you know. I know they're in sin right now, okay. And this person over here, it's just like, oh, are they doing something right? That means I don't have a reason to be mad at them, you know. Okay, now look, maybe that's just my heart. Maybe I'm confessing, and now you're all questioning, why is this guy here, okay? (laughs) But, But I'm being honest with you of just the fleshly temptation at times. Okay, to start categorizing people and discriminating on those basis. But it's not based on that. You, you forgive that person that just for some reason, out of all the people in the world, that one's just more annoying to you than others. Okay? You forgive them just like you would forgive the one you just, you just love no matter what they do, right? It's based on grace. It's not based on the merit of the person. And then do expect a renewed relationship with the one who is forgiven. But again, that speaks more to reconciliation and the the recognition that, again, this is forgiveness that takes place after they've done their part. They've asked for forgiveness, and so you then have granted that forgiveness to them. Okay, You've granted that forgiveness to them, and the relationship is restored. So there would be this expectation of a renewed relationship. Again, we forgive completely. We don't remind the forgiven person of his sin in an accusing manner. Okay, so I just want to give a caveat to that because at times there'll be a reminder if it's necessary to help the person. Okay, if it's a type of a discipleship relationship and we're kind of like we're, we're watching somebody that we're ministering to and we, we start to see they're starting to go down that subtle road they did one time before that got them in trouble and we want to remind them. That's helpful. That's suitable. That's not an accusing manner. That's actually just coming alongside according to the need of the moment, as Ephesians 4.29 would tell us, to help them in their own progress in becoming more like Christ. Okay. We forgive others in our heart, mind, even before they ask to be forgiven. We have to do business in our own hearts. See, when we, when we think about Ephesians and we think about Galatians, we think about Colossians, and, in, and in, in particular in Ephesians, when it talks about the fact that uh, in four, chapter 4, it took off putting off the old and putting on the new, and right before verse 32, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Look, we have to guard our hearts against those things. Look, we are wanting people. (laughs) We want things, and sometimes we want things too much, and we want them to such an extent that we're willing to sin against God in order to get it or sin against God if we don't get it. And so we have to be on the guard with that. Okay, I know you, you know, a lot of us have talked about, you know, sometimes we talk about the terrible twos, right? And what comes with terrible twos typically are tantrums. Just know this, in all the years of ministry, tantrums, all ages. All ages, okay? Some are just more sophisticated at it, but man, it happens. It happens in all ages. And sometimes it's internal. 
and it creates bitterness. It creates bitterness. Well, those are the things that have to be put away. That's not becoming. That's, that's old self. That's fleshly self. And, and you have, let's, not, let's just call it what it is. The fleshly self, your father was Satan. We're going to talk about, I, I, um, I have a workshop tomorrow. One of the lessons is going to be counseling those who are considering adoption. And then I've chosen actually for Sunday, of those of you who are going to be here, I'm going to preach on the doctrine of do- adoption. Okay. And, and the one thing that we learn about this is that, look, the adoption concept within Scripture theologically has nothing to do with orphans. It has everything to do with removing you from one family and putting you in another. You weren't born an orphan. You were born in a family, but you were the family you were of Satan. You were children of wrath, the sons of disobedience. And God removed you from that family. He took you away from that family, and he put you in a new one. And in in Romans 8, he speaks to the fact, I'm giving away Sunday already. Oh, well. Okay, but in Romans 8, he talks about the fact that you're no longer obligated to live under the rules and requirements of your former family. And that's dominated by the old self. And so the new self puts these things off and puts on, rather, kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiving. That's the kind of people we are to be. Mark 11, he says it like this. Hey, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that, and here's that connection, You can't separate the intimate connection between your forgiveness of others and your relationship with the Lord. Okay, you know, we're in the football season right now, right? All right. And let's see, so we're in, in, are we in Viking country? Are we all Viking people? I never assume that. Sometimes I get into areas that are like, their closest stadium is this, but they're completely other kind of fans. So I don't know, maybe it's Green Bay. Whoa. Whoa. Right on, case study. All right, uh, we got conflict in the midst. All right. But again, let's imagine it's your team and they pick up a fumble and they start running the wrong way. You know what's not happening? Coaches are not going, go! Right? And you as a teammate or a fan are going, yes! Right? No. You're not applauding and you're not, oh, and the other thing is teammates are not blocking for you. There's no, don't expect, if you're going to go the wrong way, don't expect the support of your teammates to continue going the wrong way. Don't expect the, the support of your coaches to go, the wrong, to go the wrong way. Don't expect that. So don't expect to have an intimate relationship with the Lord if you're choosing to go the wrong way. And, and, and that's really the point he's making here is, look, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Now, is he referring to your salvation? No, he's referring to the ongoing relationship you have with God the Father. If you're living with an unwillingness to forgive others, you just have to recognize the fact that your relationship with the Lord is not right. The bigger issue, when we're, again, remember the heart of the problem is the problem of the, yeah, the bigger issue is always going to be the relationship with the Lord because that's what we care about. That's soul care. And so that, that'll take precedence. Like the issue now is not about your forgiveness of that person. Right now it's about getting right with the Lord. And you have to understand that getting right with the Lord is obeying Him and forgiving as you have been forgiven. Passage of Matthew 18 in the unmerciful servant. Okay, a clear passage that teaches us on that. Okay, so to move on in your notes, we recognize then forgiveness is an act of obedience to the Lord, and it must be granted from the heart. This is an act of obedience. And and if you will, will you turn with me to Luke 17, because this is a passage that we really have to wrestle with. Matthew 18 is really clear, right, again, about the fact that, look, in light of what you have been forgiven then should you not forgive others? And, and please understand that even in that Matthew 18, you know, there's the, you know, we've got to do b- good background study when we teach on that and recognize that what the person owed him was a significant amount, so it wasn't a petty thing. So there, there's no 
there's no, when we're asking people and, and talking to people about forgiving others, we're not making light of the fact that they've been sinned against. We're never making light of the fact that they've been sinned against. We, we show sympathy. We show sympathy. We show care. But please understand, that care has to continue. We, we can't show care in the sense of showing sympathy for what they've experienced and then allow them to continue walking in disobedience to the Lord. That's not significant care. What we have to do is continue that care and see it all the way through and helping them to obey the Lord in the midst of that very trying time. Look, the Lord has been very clear with us. And that is that the walk of the Lord with our sinful flesh is difficult and it's hard. We have to get that language from Galatians 5 that the spirit and the flesh are great buds. Get along greatly, right? No, they're at enmity with one another. Okay? They're fighting one another. You're doing battle on a constant basis. If you're in Christ right now, you're doing battle on a con- every single day for you is a day of resistance. You have a day of resistance every single day of your life. Since you've become a believer, you have not lived one truly free day. You're constantly living a life of resistance. Why? Because you take you everywhere you go. This is what makes heaven so glorious. Because that's where righteousness dwells. 2 Peter chapter 3, that's where righteousness dwells. Or 5, one or the other. Anyway. And where righteousness dwells, it means this. In your new resurrected bodies, no sinful flesh. There'll be no resistance to you living righteously. It's completely un imaginable that kind of rest and that kind of peace in the meantime this is why we need the lord this is why we live lives dependent on the lord this is why you can't talk to people about this and doing this in their lives without talking to them about and making certain and assessing their use of the spiritual disciplines because that's what gives them the strength to do this but Luke 17, I want to just talk about it real quick. I want to allude to it because you're going to, you're going to want to use this passage. okay? And he talks about it right at the beginning. He says, he says to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea and then he should cause one of these little ones to sin. So pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, well, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, oh, increase our faith. See, they recognize what he's asking there is not easy. And and I want to point this out when I'm ministering to somebody i want you to notice that the apostles appreciate the fact that you are wrestling with this that you see the tension that that there's a great difficulty because when somebody's wronged us that many times it just takes a toll and we just think to ourselves sometimes that you know when is enough enough right we we begin to lament right oh lord how long how long? But listen to Jesus' response. It's very interesting. Their response is, Lord, you need to increase our faith. And, and there's almost a sense of like, yeah, we can't do this. Okay? And the Lord said, wait a minute. If you had faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And ultimately what he just said was, you don't need any more faith. This is what you need. Will any of you who have a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, hey, come at once and recline at table? 
Will he not rather say to him, in other words, he's had a hard day, and he's in a hard situation. So will you just say to him, oh, just come and recline at the table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, even though it's been a difficult day and this is difficult for you. Dress properly, serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? The heart of what Jesus is getting at, look, you don't need more faith. You need to take the faith you already have and obey it. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, see, to forgive somebody inexhaustibly, that's a command from our Lord. Say, we are unworthy servants and have only done what was our duty. You're not super Christian. You're not super elite. You're not to be put on a pedestal because you've forgiven somebody of a heinous sin. You've done what a believer in Christ is expected to do. It is one of the absolute hallmarks of what marks us as the children of God. Okay? Now, I purposely did not give you blanks in these notes because I knew there was no way I was going to cover everything, but I did want to make sure you had a lot of the points there. So we have five minutes left, okay? <laughs> so I'll cover a few things. One would be, um, is that when we talk about forgiveness practically, what are we doing? We're making a promise, okay? We're making a promise, and so you want to you want to make certain that you help the people you're counseling and discipling know what promises they're making. Okay, you're not keeping a record of wrongs suffered. Now, we, we made a mistake one time in a setting. I don't think it was in the United States. If I remember correctly, I think it was in Russia. And the joke was, so what that means is you're not keeping a journal of everything wrong your spouse is doing. And it was all a joke. Well, we come to find out that there was about five people in that group, in that gathering, who actually had journals, who had written down everything that they could remember that their spouse had done wrong, according to them, right? It wasn't according to Scripture necessarily, right? And another issue, you know, is I'm not forgiving somebody for violating my preference, Okay, that's something important. So we don't keep a record of wrongs suffered. We also do not gossip about a person's sin to others. Okay, there's parts of, um, parts of the world that, that definitely spend a lot of time talking about their offenses. They just never talk to the one who offended them. But they talk to everybody else. And, and now how do we address that? Because this actually kills relationships and this will kill a church. How do we address that? Well, one, if you're the one gossiping, stop. Just stop. Just stop it. <laughs> okay? Or I'll bury you alive in a box. Some of you will get that. Okay. So you just stop. Because Ephesians 4.29 okay, reminds us, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. It's in their head. That's the implication. It's in your head, but don't let it out. Okay, don't let it out. And so we don't gossip. But if you're listening to gossip, the question you have, have to ask is, look, are you part of the solution or the problem? Are you part of the problem or the solution? And then the question begins, whoa, have you talked to them yet? Well, no. Then you need to first go to them. If this is a, such an offense that you can't let it go, then you need to first talk to them before you can talk to anybody else. You have to first talk to them. In these kind of issues, we keep that circle as tight as possible. And some of those issues just need to be overlooked. Third, don't dwell on the offense yourself. Don't dwell on it. You want to create anxiety in your life? You want to create depression? Dwell on these things. It, it'll happen. Okay, Just think about a Philippians 4 and turn it on its head. Be anxious for everything right? Don't pray, whatever you do. And if you do pray, make sure you ask for selfish things. And make sure it's always about complaining. 
Secondly, whatever is false, whatever is unlovely, ugly, disgusting, and nasty, think about those things. And then whatever Paul's told you to do and whatever Scripture tells you to do, don't do it. All right? There's a formula for anxiety. And, and that's what dwelling on those offenses. See, again, part of this, how do we curb this and how do we help people? We help them develop a love for God and others more than themselves. Because finally, at the bottom of this, there's going to be that great theology of, of forgiveness. But at the heart of this, how much does that person love themselves? Because the more you love something, the more value you place on something, then the more sensitive you are to it being hurt. Okay? The more value you place on something. Okay, you could, you could think about some memorabilia that you have at home that just has a significant value because of who gave it to you. But it, it could be like the silliest of things, right? It could just be the silliest of things and of really no objective value at all. And somebody could come into your home and trash your computer and you're just like, eh. And then they take that little thing and they stomp it on the ground and whoa, right? You unload and become a person nobody ever thought you could be. Why? Because of the value that you have placed on that item. And if you, let's make no mistake, look, do we all agree that at least if you're watching news or catching on on anything, that people are seemingly getting offended about everything? Okay, well, listen, the world, at least some of the people of the world, have an explanation for why that's taking place. The explanation is this, we have reached the next stage of our evolution. Those things have been objectively wrong forever. But because of our ignorance in our evolution, we did not see it. But now in our evolution, we're better people. We're more, we're smarter. We're more intelligent. And that's why we recognize the offensive nature of those things. That's the explanation, at least from one point of view. I have another point of view. It's because we love ourselves way too much. And we've really gotten good at it. And as a people group, we've learned to love ourselves more than anything else. So, in the area of forgiveness, you can't miss having address the love somebody has for themselves. It's going to take a greater love for the Lord and for others to move that person toward living lives of forgiveness and doing their part to reconcile their relationships. All right? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for the time. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about forgiveness. There's so much that could be said and unpacked and but we're grateful for the hour that we've had to be able to talk about it. Lord, we recognize that this is an issue we're going to have to wrestle with in our own lives. We're going to be tempted often to be bitter, to be clamorous, to be angry. We're going to be tempted to slander. We're going to be tempted to love ourselves more than you and others. So we ask you, Lord, not to lead us into temptation, but deliver us and to help us do that right battle that's so necessary, pursuing you, pursuing and loving others. And Father, help us then as well to be able to clearly articulate this and to just delve into the issues that um, a person might be struggling with that's keeping them from living out, forgiving others as a natural and normal just course of their life as a child of God. We thank you for forgiveness, certainly, Lord. We thank you that you do not deal with us according to our sins. And so it's in you we trust, it's in you we depend, and it's in you that we are so amazingly grateful for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.